Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start this morning with our call to worship, which is our Advent candle. Today, we relight the candle of hope. Now we light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. From the prophet Isaiah, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace and that's from isaiah 9 6 and 7. from the gospel of john peace i leave with you my peace i give to you i do not give to you as the world gives do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid and that's John 14, 27. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and in the countries of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you'll please pray with me. Lord of love and light, shine through our darkness bringing us hope open our hearts for the journey our eyes for the light our spirits for the peace which you bring fill our mouths with laughter and speech with shouts of joy that we shall reveal the love with which you surround us we offer this prayer in the name of the one who is coming into the world bringing your hope love peace and joy Jesus Christ now please join me in the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if you'll join me in singing hymn number 251, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. And you may stand if you're able.
first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And I'm reading from the New International Version. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And also from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrath, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from the old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely. From then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, and we will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. Thus ends our reading. And now we come to the responsive reading. If you will read along with me, what's printed in your bulletin. Lord, you are the light of our world. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O gracious God of promise, we worship together as we await the fulfillment of your, work, of your wondrous plan. Help us to grow as we hear your word and live in your love. Let us the season of Advent give us the opportunity to show love to others as you have loved us by giving us your Son, Jesus. May the light of God's love always shine in our hearts. Rejoice, Emmanuel will come to us. If the, sorry. Um, all right, our next thing is our dedication of tithes and offerings. So if you could stand, we will sing hymn number 815, the doxology.
turn to uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, uh, also going to be reading from the New International Version, uh, verses 8 through 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what they had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. God, we ask that uh, you help illumine this story, uh, just light it up in our minds to see the insights that you have in your word, the hope and the encouragement, the peace that you want us to have. These are all gifts, and so we trust you uh, in this, we pray. Amen. So the gift of peace, the gift of peace. And focusing uh, these uh these messages through Advent, we recognize that there are many gifts that God gives us. Uh, you know, if we don't receive the gift, sometimes we don't have what that is. So sometimes we don't have peace until we receive the gift of peace. I want to read a uh, story. Someone has uh, written this as a creative story, and it says this. There once lived a king who announced a uh, a prize to an artist who would paint the best artwork depicting peace. Many great painters sent the king several of their best art pieces. One of the pictures among them was of a various masterpiece was a calm lake perfectly mirroring a peacefully towering snow-capped mountain. Overhead was a clear blue sky and fluffy clouds. The picture was perfect. Most of the people who viewed these pictures thought that this was the best picture of all of them. But when the king announced the winner, everyone was shocked. The picture that won the prize had mountains too, but they were rugged and bare. The sky looked angry with strikes of lightning. It did not look peaceful at all. 
It looked like the artist had mistakenly submitted the painting depicting a storm rather than peace. But anyone who looked closely at the painting could see a tiny bush growing in the cracks of a rock. And in the bush, a mother bird had built her nest. In the midst of the rush of angry weather, the bird sat on her nest with peace. Peace does not mean that it's the place where there's no noise or trouble. Peace means that in the midst of chaos, still can be a calm in the heart. The real peace is a state of mind, not a state of surroundings. So the mother bird in her calm, despite her uh, chaotic surrounding, was the best representation for this king to understand what peace was. I have to admit that when, when I read the Gospels, read about Jesus' birth, I, I kind of think in a way that disconnects me from the actual account of what happened. Because I, you know, like you, I hang the nativity and the crushes and we decorate with that, and it seems quaint. But um, it's really kind of strange. Because uh, mothers prepare for babies. We even talk about it like with birds. So they, they go into nesting, and any birth comes along, if anyone loves them, we have showers and everybody goes into nesting to make sure that this baby gets everything that it needs to be born in the right consequence, the right situation. But nothing was right for a child to be born in the way that Jesus was born. It's strange, it's odd. What's, what's this baby doing? No less the Son of God out in an animal uh, storage. Some some think it was a cave, some think it was a barn. No matter, it was the place for animals to be born, some kind of shelter, but Jesus born in an animal trough is a strange thing, no matter how much we romanticize it and put the lights around it. It's, there's something strange about it. Because if you remember for Mary, who would have been thinking what in the world am I going to do to prepare for this baby to come? It was strange because what she had been told was, you will conceive in your womb, you will bear a son, you will give him the name of Jesus. He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Most High. It's like, there was no way for Mary to imagine that giving birth was going to be in such a strange place. And, and to bring him into this world, how, how could he be the son of the Most High? I, I think that it might be more like we're, we're hearing that you're going to meet the king in a castle and you wind up meeting him in an alley. It, it's a strange thing. It didn't line up with the grandeur of prophecy. And I, and I think that's really helpful to us to recognize that it doesn't all line up. Because sometimes... We get a word from God, we get an assurance from God, we pray and we believe, we act on God's promise and what we believe he told us to do. And then after we act on that, like Mary did, things don't seem to line up. Something's not right. And we think that everything should come together beautifully to make a beautiful picture, not a strange one. And yet there are things that we face in pursuing God, in obeying God, that we face things that are kind of strange. Because the prophecy here from Isaiah is like, you know, the government will be on his shoulders, this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. It's like, how could you imagine that this one is born in an animal barn? For the Bethlehem out of you will be one who's ruler over Israel. He will be our peace. And yet, it didn't seem to be the situation where she's bringing him into the world that was not what you think of for, I want a peaceful birth. It wasn't in the birth plan of Mary, I guarantee you. It, it was something different. But yet, he will be our peace. He will be our peace. Now, when we read about peace for the Jews, we, we have the word shalom, 
And shalom meant this. It was a concept of peace. Rooted in the word shalom meant wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity. And it carried a sense that this was got to go on. It was a sense of permanence in that. And yet we live in a world that is impermanent. And, and uh, even in like Buddhist philosophy, they're like, the, the thought to get people from their troubled mind is to tell them to embrace that life is impermanent. And yet the thought in our Christian faith is to embrace the God who is eternal. And so he is our rock. He is our fortress. He is the one who, who carries us through. And so we see this... Uh, promise, and I think if we truly understand what shalom means and the greeting of, of one Jew to another, to, to wish that kind of wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, that's something we all want. We want that kind of peace. We want things around us to be calm. But someone has said uh, in description of life that, you know, life happens and we get the peace drained out of us. Has that ever happened to you? It's like you start your day out in peace and then something comes and then here it is. I mean, even just simple things can rob us of peace. We, we have a busy street where people walk their dogs and, um, and there is, for the most part, all of the people are friendly for the most part and uh, most of the dogs are friendly, but uh, you know, most, most people will at least tell us, well, He's not friendly enough for Teddy to, to greet you. So Teddy thinks everybody's his friend. And so every person, every dog, everybody's a new friend. But then we have this one individual that is extremely grumpy. I mean, I'm not talking about the animal. I'm talking about the, the man that walks the dog. And, and he's a kind of nasty guy. And the dog seems to be trained to fight and, like, tear up other dogs. I was like, do you have to walk on our street? <laughs> you know, and, and yet, you know, we, things can interrupt our peace, let's put it that way. And so we look out and we see who's walking and it's like, okay, now it's time to go for a walk. <laughs> but some things in life, conversations that you might have with people, family, work, social media, somebody is out there and can rob you the peace can be drained out of you. The shalom can be drained from your life. And so, so we have to be uh, careful in that because uh, Janie and I, honestly, we love Hallmark movies, and yet Hallmark is not the way of real life, is it? You know, everybody in Hallmark has, you know, the, the teachers have these, you know, the kitchen alone must be $100,000 in the way that they have these homes, the decorations. It's like everybody has everything and the problems are really superficial compared to real life. And it all gets wrapped up and, and for a while, for a couple of years, it was all over a cup of Folgers coffee <laughs> that, that it all got resolved. And that does not seem to be the way that life is, nor is it the way that God came into the world. It's not the way Jesus came into the world. Mary and Joseph had to run for their lives to protect Jesus. It's like, which part of that aligned with the prophecies about who Jesus was? It's like, you would think you would have some greater protection and, and greater sense of status in this world, and yet they had the hardship along with him. And so it's, it's helpful for us to remember that not everything is amazing even when we're following God not everything is amazing we face real enemies and in the news the workplace and in Proverbs 6 16 through 19 it it almost describes the opposition that we face that is going to tear apart our peace it says this there are six things that the Lord hates seven that are detestable to him Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Does that sound like news? A heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, a 
person who stirs up conflict in the community. It's all around us. And yet God has called us to give peace that sometimes is only the internal thing that we have. It doesn't necessarily change the surroundings that we live in. Jesus said in John 14, I have I've spoken while I'm still with you as he's ready to depart from the disciples, ready to, to die on the cross. He says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. God was pleased in Colossians 1, 19 through 20. As God was pleased to have the fullness dwell in him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so as we come to communion today, we recognize that the peace that God has for us to, to in, take internally, it was bought. So it's a gift, but it was bought with Christ's blood. And so we, we don't find peace in this world because Jesus had to buy it on our behalf. We can try to find peace in whatever else, anything that we might try is not going to get us the peace that Jesus will bring that lasts in spite of the storm. It's not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of the living God is where our peace comes from. And so the, the peace, the shalom flows from the source, not the situation. Flows from the source, not the situation. Philippians uh, 4, 6 through 7 says that the peace of God transcends the situation. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Maybe like Mary, we need to ponder the gift of Jesus in our heart, and it will be easier for us to find the peace. But that, that peace from God, like the love of God, it's not just a, a download from heaven. It's not just a personal, I accept Jesus into my heart, but we're called into a peaceful community that we extend the shalom like the greetings the Jews did, extending the peace of God to one another. Paul to the Corinthian church, which is a church filled with envy and pride, dissension, division, every kind of thing that you don't want in your church, that was the Corinthian church. And, and Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and he said, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for a full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And so as, so as we come to communion, we recognize this vertical connection with God to peace, but we recognize as well as we share in community the peace that we have with one another. Dr. Manfred Brock was uh, my professor at uh, Eastern Seminary, and he, he said that when you look at the recognizing without recognizing the body of Christ, then in one sense that might be the body of our Lord, but it's also the body of believers. And so we, we come sharing of that cup and communion to commune with God and to commune with one another. That's, that's what the peace is about. Uh, Paul Martini has uh, ministered in some, some places doing some uh, tremendous encouragement with people. And he said, peace is a person. Peace is a person. It's, we can read about peace all we want. It's not, again, the absence of conflict. It's not about our surroundings. It's about who has come into our life to give us an eternal and a lasting peace, not just a situational reprieve. And so those are the things that when we come together around the communion table, that we see that God is with us in ways that will last beyond the situation but we have to look for it. 
We have to find him. And I pray that we'll do that now. God, I pray that you will help us to be your people, encouraged by you, looking for you, pondering the wonders of your promises like Mary did. It's not that different for us to say, God, may you do as you would with my life. But then to trust you and to find peace in the midst of the surprises and crazy of the world, to know that you are the one who has character and will bless us. That is, that is our hope. That is our living peace through Jesus. And we thank you for him. Amen. So that <coughs> not building that thing back here. It sounds like I'm doing a cooking class. <laughs> Just knocking some water down. So if you'll uh, grab your communion cup. And then just pull off for the wafer the representation of the body of Christ. Because the night that he was betrayed, think about what the Lord went through in the way he lived out. Here he is, God's son, and humbly living out for our sake. Every kind of trial, every kind of temptation, every kind of suffering was there. And he did it on our behalf to bring peace into our hearts, to bring wholeness. And so he was broken. Let's break this. He was broken for us. He said, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat that together. if you prefer your cup. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, which is the promise of salvation. He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of this together, knowing that this is what has brought us peace in time. And so whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is our hope, that he has died on our behalf. He is the first of those who died and then first resurrected, that we might be resurrected with them. All right, let us turn to hymn number 272. you have shown 
through the ages you've shown in the scriptures how you are present, how you have brought victory, how you bring peace. You brought the messengers, and we thank you for the times that you speak to our hearts and bring the messages of encouragement that we need. We know that sometimes we need messengers that may be the mouth of another believer, that from their lips you bring things that we need to hear, encouragement, blessing, and, and direction. We know that you give insight, you give wisdom without finding fault, and you come to bring blessing on this earth. It's not just for ourselves. We, we thank you that you have called us to be messengers as well. Alongside the angels, we declare your goodness, your faithfulness, your presence, goodwill toward men is, is what you have for us. And we thank you that you are not an angry God, a God who is distant, or a God who's not interested in us, but you are, you are there in every part understanding our weakness, but proclaiming goodness, encouragement, and blessing. Help us to be those who are peacemakers, who, who make the way for others to find you, because you are the one who makes all the difference in our lives. And so we pray it not just for ourselves or in this community, but we pray it across uh, this world that we live in, releasing your peace in Jesus' name. Amen. For a benediction, uh, Numbers 6, 24 through 26 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace or shalom. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. As a post, let us all sing, Let's be the tithe of thine.